Well, let's jump in the series that we've been in in 2024, simply called People Like Us. People Like Us, it's a teaching series looking at what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, which is where Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And he taught the people, and he, he came to clarify a lot of confusion about what faith was all about, about what following God was all about. There were some religious people who were very religious and very unlike Jesus. And Jesus came to say, I know you've heard it this way, or I know people have modeled faith this way. And he sat everybody down, and basically it was like Vision Sunday. He's like, I'm going to cast some vision, like we would do here at Lakeside, except it was for the, all the, the people of this community. And he began to teach them, and he's saying, hey, people like us, he would, he would simply put it this way, people like us do things like this. And he would say, hey, we want to we paint this picture of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he was basically doing three things. He was casting vision, he was creating culture, and he was inviting everyone. He was saying, hey, you are all invited. Again, no matter who you are, no matter where you grew up, no matter what people taught you, I get it, you're invited. But essentially he would say, people like us do things like this. And he went on to paint the picture of what it's like to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he would say, hey, I want, I want you to understand that if you say yes to me, you're saying yes to this. You're saying yes to, to these types of things because this is what I'm like. This is what it is to follow after me. Because the Pharisees of that day, they were proclaiming a faith but living a different way. And we all know, unfortunately, what that's like. To, to, to have a belief but end up finding ourselves living a way that is contrary to the way of faith. I'm reading a book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great theologian. He was martyred for his faith by the Nazis in World War II. And, and he, he put it this way, we build God a temple, but then we go live in our own homes. And, and, and we want to understand that tension of going, I don't want it to be that way, God. I don't want to come to church with a faith, but then go live some way entirely different. And Jesus was like, hey, follow me. This is what the kingdom of God is like. I want to show you people like us do things like this. And so he began this vision cast, this creating of culture, this invitation. He said, I'm going to describe what people in my kingdom are like. And he went on to, to say, blessed are these types of people. But it wasn't the kind of blessing that we would think of because when we think that people are blessed, we think of up and to the right. We think I'm blessed because I got the job. I'm blessed because we got pregnant. I'm blessed because things are working out the way that we had hoped. That's how we normally think of blessing. That's not necessarily wrong. It's just normal. Jesus just said, guess what? Even when things aren't working out, even when you find yourself not in those other categories, there is still a blessing for you. There is a life in me, and I want to show you how life can be blessed even when nothing is up and to the right. So he began to invite people into a different kind of blessing. And I don't think it was a very good PR move. Honestly, if you're trying to sell something, I would not be selling stuff the way Jesus was trying to sell stuff. Like in one part, not today's message, it's for another day, but just might, might want to put this in the back of your brain. He's like, it's basically impossible to follow me if you're rich. Like, can you imagine all the rich people? Like, oh, great, that's phenomenal. Thanks for the invitation. He's like, yeah, like, you might as well put, like, a camel through the eye of a needle instead of trying to do that. I mean, it's just, it's just, you're a piece of work. Like, oh, okay. And they're like, this is hard. He's like, yeah, it's actually impossible. So, like, this is the kind of PR pitch that Jesus would do, and people are trying to wrap their mind around it because they were trying to figure out how to do it in their own strength. And God's like, let me change the way that you even think. And I will paint something better for you because it's a different kind of blessing. And so he began the Sermon on the Mount with what is known as the Beatitudes. Very weird word, Beatitudes. But it was this list of the people in his kingdom and a list of blessing. Again, it's a different kind of list. Here are the Beatitudes. He would say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, and blessed are the peacemakers. And each week we've looked at what in the world does it mean to be poor in spirit or, or to be merciful or to have a pure heart? What does it mean? And, and what does this mean to be blessed? And Jesus is saying, like, my kingdom, this is what it looks like to live in my kingdom. 
And the payoff is incredible, but it's countercultural. And again, it's not a great sales pitch like, hey, all you sad people, come on over. This is the perfect place for you, right? Like, like hmm, not exactly the toe touch yay experience, right? It's this weird kind of sales pitch where Jesus is saying, this is what it's like. Again, if you were to be enticed to follow someone into something and to, to buy what they're selling, if you will, uh, even in the religious terms, you're like, wait a second, I've heard something about like a bougie celestial heaven with like streets of gold. Do we get that too? Like, but Jesus, he's not talking about streets of gold. He's like, blessed are the merciful. This is what my kingdom is like. And of course, Rome was in tyranny over the Hebrew Jewish people. And so, so they might be going, well, what about, what about like, if we follow you, will you overthrow Rome? Because the government has gone to hell in a handbasket. And Jesus is like, I- I'm not really here to talk about that right now. But that could have gained followers so fast. Jesus didn't teach it. Not only did Jesus not teach it, track with me here, he didn't embody it. He didn't embody the overthrow of Rome and the the just up and to the right and all your problems go away. He embodied this. Because the kingdom of God is not just about God. It is is God. It's a picture of who Jesus is. Jesus was poor in spirit. Jesus mourned. Jesus was meek. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Jesus was merciful. Jesus was pure in heart. Jesus was a peacemaker. He's like, if you're going to follow me, this is the way to live. And he embodied it for us like the most incredible teacher of all teachers because so many teachers, pastors included, can be guilty of saying, do it this way, but I'm not really great at it. And Jesus said, do it this way, not because you should, but because it's actually who I am. And you will experience a blessed life, a blessing that the world could never give you. And he ends this beatitudes, this list of blessing. If this wasn't a bad PR pitch, in the first place, he ends it with quite the closing sales pitch. He says this, blessed are the persecuted. Come one, come all in my kingdom. Guess who's going to be there? Persecuted people. Who's in? Who's in? Who's in? Who's in? What a sales pitch. Some of you um, have done the, um, um, what do you call those things? The timeshare things. You know what I'm talking about? And you sat down across the table from a timeshare person. God bless them. Lord, help them. Save them. Jesus. And if you are one of them, hey, man, you have a talent, a gift. You, you're so talented, uh, you can, like, turn a piece of paper upside down and write backwards so that people who are facing you can understand what you're doing. It's very talented. But, like, like if you are trying to sell a timeshare, you are not going, and guess what it's like here? Persecution, come on, who's in, who's in, who's in? Like, no, you would not do that. You would say, tell me that we're going to be healthy. Tell me that we're going to be wealthy. And tell me that my kids are always going to listen to me. That will get me to sign up for something. Jesus, help us. And God's like, I'm not, I'm not selling you that because that's actually not what my kingdom is all about. It's actually better than that. But you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to see how this life will actually form you and shape you. I will be the potter. You will be the clay. And it will form you and shape you in a way that this world can never give you. And so he was setting the record straight. Now, it's very important, especially if you're just now joining us for this series, uh, the Beatitudes are not, are not something that Jesus wanted us to aspire to. It's not like, well, I guess we should aspire to be persecuted. Let's go get persecuted. Or God just wants us to mourn. He wants us to be sad, I guess. And so this is the list that we should aspire to. This is not a list that we should aspire to. God is saying, I, I, I'm not wanting you to be sad. I'm not wanting you to be persecuted. Here's what Jesus was saying when you find yourself here when you find yourself mourning when you find yourself in persecution when you find yourself you are not left out of blessing you didn't get the short end of the stick god hasn't ignored you in fact he's actually inviting you you very much belong in the kingdom of god there is a place for you and there is more for you than you can imagine you belong here and experience me even in the midst of things that we wouldn't want for ourselves much less those around us So he goes, let me explain. So we get to this last one, a persecuted, like, do do we have to? Is this optional? Where's the opt-in, opt-out? Is there a 90-day back guarantee? Like, how does this work? Jesus was super clear with this one, so much so 
that you could make a case that there's actually nine Beatitudes, not eight. But eight and nine have to deal with just really bad things, mainly persecution. So we're lumping them together in this message. But let's begin with verse 10, then we'll get to verse 11. Here's verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know how much that makes sense to you, but I think the people listening to him right there were like, huh? And so he kept going. Look at verse 11. He says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So Jesus is like, you're not sure what persecution is? I'm just going to give you a whole list, okay? Persecution, insults, falsely say, uh, say all types of things about you. This life is a blessed life. And I don't know if this helped at all, because I don't know about you, but my first thought is this. How is this blessed? This makes no sense. How is this blessed? persecution, people ridiculing, insulting. How is this blessed? Let's go back to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How is this blessed? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, still a little confusing. It's one thing for you to give me something tangible, like, if any of you want to give me a car, I'll take it. You know, like, hey, it's a new car. Like, yes, I, I will take it. I will drive it. Thank you, Jesus. A new car, it, it makes sense on what it is, for theirs is a new car. <laughs> but this is not tangible. It is something on the invisible. It is this kingdom that is not of this world. What does it mean for us to be a part or to be given the kingdom of heaven? Well, thankfully, this isn't the only part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is explaining this idea of living in this world that we wouldn't choose persecution, insults, all these types of things, false accusations, and yet receiving something and having something that would, we would consider a blessing. Moments later, still in Matthew chapter 5, just a few verses down, we see this in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. So he's saying, blessed are those who are persecuted. We shouldn't just try to get along with our enemies, but love our enemies, even pray for those who who per persecute. Why should we pray for those who persecute us? Why should we be doing this? Look at the last part. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Here's this reference once again to this kind of invisible kingdom. In fact, let's put the two verses on the same screen. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Why? So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. There is this attachment of an identity to a family that when we experience these things, when we understand persecution, when we don't cave in, there is this kingdom that we are a part of, a family that we are a part of. Now, like it or not, we're all part of a family, okay? Like it or not. You receive some DNA that you're grateful for and not so grateful for. Can I get an amen from somebody? right? I tell my daughters, I'm like, I am so sorry that your dad's not athletic. I am sorry. I, I, I pass nothing on to you of goodness in, in that category. That's why I run marathons. I just run slowly in the same direction for long periods of time. Literally no athletic ability whatsoever. In fact, yesterday I was running on um, Willow Creek Trail right through here down towards Lake Natoma, and I missed the path, but there was like kind of a, you can skip the path where it's not paved or anything, and there's some rocks and stuff, and it's just this little, like, think of a gazelle, just, right, just, just, just a, little, a little leap, and I'm like, 
I'm down. I can do this. I am able and agile and mobile. And I went to this little gazelle jump. You would have thought that I went through the gauntlet of doom. I'm like, poof, 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 just run over. And I literally looked around. I've got my hydration vest on. I'm all decked out in my gear because I want to at least look the part, even if I'm not the part. I literally looked around and like, who saw me? Who saw me? Who saw me? <laughs> There are parts of us that we do not want to pass on to our family. I say all that to get to this part of God saying, when you are living this out, there is an identity that you belong here. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus did not cave in to persecution. There is this family where God says, if you understand this, there is a blessing, there is a belonging. You actually belong in this kingdom and you will experience a blessing because of it. You belong here. And Jesus explains this further in verse 46. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you get... If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. He's saying, listen, you, you like love your own people? Everybody's doing that. Tax collectors who have sold out on their own people, they have their little tax collector homeboys, their little cronies, their little hangout crew. They're already doing that with their own people. You greet your own people. Even pagans are doing that. He's saying, I'm inviting you to experience a world that is beyond what normal humans do, something that is a part of my kingdom, and it is a blessed life you will experience a life in me and through me that everybody else that's doing their own thing and coming to their own conclusions will never experience. Perhaps you know just from American history, Harriet Tubman, one of the most influential women in history, certainly American history. She was a slave, and she, we have the privilege of, of reading her writings of what it was like for her specifically to live as a slave. And she, she ended up freeing thousands and thousands and thousands of slaves by going back into harm's way even when she didn't have to. In one part of her writing, she wrote about being sick, almost on a deathbed from Christmas all the way through March. And again, she was a slave, which meant she was not able to perform her duties as expected by her slave owner. And so she was ridiculed and beaten and abused. Her owner would bring in other people and he would try to sell her just to get rid of her. If you want to talk about persecution, you want to talk about some excuses to just not be okay, Harriet Tubman owned those excuses if she wanted to. But Harriet Tubman understood life in the kingdom of God. And in her writings, she would write how on her bed she would pray, God, come and save this man. Come and save this man. Come and save this man. Show him a different way to think. She prayed for those who were persecuting her. She was loving those who had no love towards her. And in this world, she experienced something that no one outside of this kingdom could experience. And God is saying, when that happens, I have a blessing for you, a fullness that other people will not experience outside my kingdom. And that, my friends, is difficult. It is counter-cultural. While we want to shake our fists, while we want to, for revenge, while we hope that they fail, God invites us into a different kind of life, even in persecution. But there's something that Harriet had that should paint a picture for all of us. And Jesus was saying, there's something for you. Not only is this hard, but he wraps up this portion of the text with verse 48. Look at what he says. 
Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Like, Jesus, this is our, oh, I know. In fact, you need to be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I do this all the time. I use this as my out to not be like Jesus. I'm like, you're Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I'm a piece of work. Hello. My name is Brian. I'm a piece of work. I'm not going to be like Jesus, so get over it, right? Like, this can kind of be my out, but there is no out. And Jesus is saying, I want you to live this way. And if we think the wrong way about this phrase, we will just excuse ourselves away from it. I'm not perfect. I can never do this. The pain is too bad. That person treated me so horribly. Our home is dysfunctional or broken because of her, because of him. I lost my job because of him. My world was turned upside down because that happened. And we can just go, this is how it is. And Jesus says, be perfect. If we don't understand the depth of this word, we will excuse ourselves away from it. This does not mean be perfect as in never screw up. I want to take you and, and have you look at the word perfect a little bit more because in the Greek, in the Greek, it's this word teleos. And this word doesn't mean without uh, making mistakes. This idea, it's a picture of wholeness. He's saying, I want you to be whole, not broken, not incomplete. In other words, in God's kingdom, he's saying your response, your, your invitation to this, by saying yes to me, you will be made whole. You will lack nothing. You will want nothing. There won't be a category, a portion of your life that is still messed up because you refuse to allow me to heal you. Jesus is saying, if you will allow me, I will make you whole. I will enable you to do things that seem impossible because my spirit is able to do what you cannot do for yourselves. Outside the kingdom, we have gaps. Outside the kingdom, this is just the way that it's gonna be. If you had the dad that I had, if you had the circumstances I had, if that happened to you, you might be this way too. And we excuse ourselves away from the very wholeness that God wants us to experience. And so often the only way to experience this is the presence of God even in the midst of persecution. Even in the midst when people have wronged us, we say, God, not my way, but your way. And when we do, we have an ability to be human in a way that we could not without Jesus. Harriet Tubman is a beautiful picture of wholeness, of what God worked in her and through her. So, for us, when we experience persecution, we don't avoid it. We don't run away from it. We don't shy away from it. We don't look for easy street. We don't detach from this world because we're so afraid of it. We actually go, okay, if it happens, if the persecution comes my way, it's not that God wants it for our life, but when we find ourselves in this, this pressure situation, God can, can do something with it in a way so much so that it's a blessing because he forms and shapes us in the midst of this persecution, insult, way of life that we would never choose for ourselves. Let me put it this way. Standing firm forms. By standing firm, by not buckling, by not running away, by not just, just trying to exit out and, and detach ourselves from this world or from the society or from whatever situation we find, by standing firm, we actually see the wholeness of what God wants to do in us. People like us do things like this. Remember Isaiah chapter 64? Mold us, shape us. Sometimes we're like, God, mold me and shape me, but not that way. Come on, somebody, are you with me? You know, we sing songs. That I think this is why God created music. He's like, I'll get you to sing something that you would never pray on your own and like just without seeing it. We sing things like, mold me, shape me, have your way with me. That's not a song, nor should it ever be. <laughs> nor should I ever do that again. Let's just finish this off. But, but we have, that was pretty bad. But we have, we sing these things and we're like, God, do your work in me. And God's like, okay, it's gonna happen through pressurized situations that you would never choose for yourself. And we're like, no, 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 no. I'm looking for easy street. And Jesus said, I never preached easy street. I preached this way is actually going to be a blessed life. 
shape me, God. Now, I want to be super clear because we're talking about persecution. And in America today, the Christians of America have been shouting a little bit more loud than usual about how they are being persecuted in the society in which we live. And I just want to throw out at least a yellow flag, a caution that you call persecution the right thing. Because if you get a worldview of what's actually happening all around the world, we might tone down a little bit this, this cry that we shout from the mountaintops. So what I want to do just very quickly is give you a worldview of not the type of persecution that was happening in Jesus' day. I want to give you just very quickly a worldview of the type of persecution that's happening around our world today outside of the United States, okay? Here's some stats based off of 2003. Christian persecution in 2023. 5,000 people were killed because they were Christians. 4,000 people were abducted because they were Christians. 15,000 churches were attacked or closed because they were churches. 295,000 people were forcibly displaced from their homes because of their faith. Not that they happened to be Christians, but because they were Christians. This is a different kind of persecution. Let's go to the next slide. 365 million Christians live in nations today with high levels of persecution or discrimination. 78 countries qualified in 2023 compared to only 40 in 1993. The amount of nations experiencing high levels of persecution, 40 in 1993, 78 as of last year. High levels. Let's break that down real quick. Last one. That's one in seven believers worldwide, one in five believers in Africa, two in five believers in Asia are experiencing a high level of persecution for their faith. Now, it's important for us to understand and pray for and recognize what's going on in our world today. But it's also okay for us to look at the world that we live, live in, look at the scriptures that we're supposed to live by and go, if we are never to be in this situation, God forbid, if we're never threatened with our life, does the, does the Sermon on the Mount, specifically this part of persecution, does it have anything to do with us? And I would say absolutely it does. Because there are different kinds of persecution. We do face, watch this, different kinds of pressure to conform. Think about it. Someone, when we think of someone who is uh, martyred for their faith, we may picture someone that's saying, renounce Christ or die. And in that moment, you can probably visualize someone that either has to say, I renounce Christ or doesn't, and they die on the spot. There is pressure to conform. And when they don't conform, they are martyred. We will probably never face that. But there is pressure in your life to conform. There is pressure in your life, and I would say a gravitational pull for all of us for this idea of self-preservation. Not to stay living as if we are about to be martyred, but self-preservation as in, I want to keep my friends. I don't want to cause a problem. I don't want to uh, be different. I, I just want to fit in. I, I want to lower my views on theology so, so that I can just kind of live in the society because I have a desire that's normal for self-preservation. And we can have this pressure. It's just like the fear of persecution there is a fear of self-preservation. Let's put it up on the screen. Fear of persecution is in many ways a fear of self-preservation. And so we look at ourselves and go, is there a pressure in our lives to compromise? You know, this has been happening since the beginning of time, beginning of scriptures, the Garden of Eden. Perhaps you know this story where, where Satan, the serpent, comes to Eve and, and wants Eve to compromise and says, did did God really say, I mean, come on, let's not get cray-cray here. Did God really say that you can't eat from, from the fruit of, of the garden? She's like, well, actually, it's just this one tree. And he's like, come on, I, yeah, just God. And there's this, this compromise, this self-preservation to compromise. Don't, don't just, don't go, just, just compromise a little bit. There is a pressure on us in our society to compromise. 
There are entire churches that are beginning to compromise theology, compromise these things because they just want to fit in. And they're no longer shining bright as a picture of what it is to be blessed in the kingdom of God. We all face pressures like this. Maybe it's a pressure of self-preservation, not of compromising, but just of inaction. Perhaps there is justice that God has invited us to step into, but the self-preservation of, of not getting involved, of looking the other way, kind of like the priests and the Levites in the story of the Good Samaritan. I, I don't want to get involved, self-preservation. I don't want to, to go there because you just want your comfortable little life. We are all invited to walk into this world and say, God, I want to be who you called me to be. I don't want to compromise in my faith because of the blessing that you have for me. Francis Schaeffer, who's a th who was a theologian, a philosopher, he, he put it this way, I believe pluralistic secularism in the long run is a more deadly poison than straightforward persecution. This idea of pluralistic secularism, of just kind of like, you know what, it's all good. We're just all, you know, it's all good. Don't raise it. It's just, it's all good. We sh there shouldn't be any rights and wrongs. Just kind of water it all down. And, and what happens is he's saying this can be more damaging than just the church being persecuted outright. And, and I agree with him. Here's the problem is that Christians, people like you and like me, but hopefully not entirely like you and me, they've said, you know what, society's the problem secularism is the problem and they've gone to war against society war against the secular war against those bad people out there as if that is going to change everything and Jesus rather than warring against the people out there Jesus says I want you to war against what's going on in here you are the light of the world you are a city on the hill you are to shine like the stars in the heavens. Don't war against people out there. Let God have your heart in here. But there's a little dopamine hit when we get angry with people out there. There's a little bit of adrenaline. There's a little bit of, ha -ha. and then you find people that have the same dopamine and adrenaline hits as you, and they're Christians too, and you're like, yeah, and you look at each other, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're looking at the people out there like, you're like, meow, 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 meow. And this is what happens. And then you have churches that society is looking at and you're like, and they're like, I don't know what's happening. They're just angry people that hate us because it's all meow, 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 meow. It's like an angry cat or something. I don't know what I just did there. Meow, meow. meow, meow. And there were already Pharisees doing that in Jesus' day. He's like, that's not the way forward. That's not the blessed life. There is a wholeness that God wants to put in you. There is a completeness, a perfection of submitting to the ways of God. And in the midst of trial, in the midst of you standing firm, not shaking your fist, but saying, God, I want to I honor you well. I want you to form and shape me so that I can love my enemy, so I can pray for those who persecute me. We have people that won't even pray for the president that they didn't vote for out of principle. And those principles are not in the Bible. And so Jesus says, I have something so much better for you. This is the way of my kingdom. Love those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you because Jesus loved us before we ever loved him back. This is the way forward and the wholeness that God wants to create in us. Even when it's hard, we can be different than how everyone else responds to hard. I want to wrap up this message today by pointing out the Apostle Paul who had this understanding and experienced much of what Jesus is talking about. In 2 Corinthians 12, he has the audacity to say this. This is why, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a list. And it's not good PR. 
weaknesses, come on, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. He says, I delight in them. I delight, why? Because Paul understood, even in storms that we would never choose, there's a blessed life of wholeness to live and to love and to be in a way that we could never be outside the kingdom of God. I want to invite the band to come forward as we begin to just really wrap our minds around this kingdom that we're invited into. The Beatitudes technically end with verse 12, where Jesus says all these things about insults and those types of things. But of course, Jesus wasn't done. He had a longer sermon than the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is this discourse. And I want to read to you what continues after the Beatitudes, because Jesus, again, says all these Beatitudes, then he paints this picture, this enticing picture that I hope you have a yes for, that we can say together, God, we want this for our lives and for our church and for our community. He says this after the Beatitudes, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He goes on to say this, next verse. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. People like us do things like this. It's backwards, it's upside down, it's countercultural, but it is the way forward. And it is the way to wholeness. And it is the picture that God has for you. In the midst of your mess, in the midst of your brokenness, on this side of the picture where you're like, God, I am a piece of work. He's like, You're invited. You are invited. This is a place for you. Just know this, people like us do things like this. And if we will continue to open our hands, to open our hearts, to open our minds, and let God change the way that we think, we will live a blessed life that we could never live any other way. And Jesus says, this is the way forward. And thankfully, he embodied what he taught. Jesus had the opportunity, perhaps you know this part of the story, will become more and more relevant as we get closer to Easter. Jesus had the opportunity to self-preserve. Before he was crucified on the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is feeling all sorts of human because he was fully human. And he says, Father, if there's any way for this to happen without it actually happening. (laughs) Let's do that. In other words, God, if, if we can avoid this persecution, let's do that. But then he says this, yet not my will, but your will be done. And he followed through and went to the cross and scorned its shame because he loved you so much and wanted you to have access to the kingdom which he came to give. So, you and I are invited to not just believe in God, to not just call yourself a Christian, not just have a faith that is attached to maybe your family history. So much more than that. You are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good to have it change the way that you live and you look, the way that you love. Not because you have to earn your way up to God. We can't. We respond by choosing to live this way because God came all the way to us. Let's be people who shine like stars in the heavens so that those around us may glorify our Father in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, these are the verses that 
we don't necessarily underline in our Bibles. They're not our favorite verses. They don't produce all the fuzzy feelings. We don't like to think of persecution. But God, would you continue to shape us in a way that even when we feel alone, even when we feel like the world is against us, however that may come, may we have a heart that says, God, shape us and form us in your way. Lord, be that anchor of hope in our lives. Be that anchor of peace. I pray for every person in this room right now. God, that we would say yes to you. That your goodness, your kindness would draw us to turn from the life that we're in to say yes to you. Out of repentance, we draw near to you and your goodness. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.